work. Yes. Okay. Thank you all for coming to the August edition of Ripe. Um, nope, the August edition of the Sunny's Book Club, which we read Ripe by Sarah Rose Etter. Uh, definitely one of like my most anticipated reads of 2023. So I was really excited to read this with you all. And shout out to Sarah Rose Etter and Scribner who sent us all of those fun freebie stuff that you guys should have gotten your boxes. So um appreciate you if you're watching this Sarah if you're googling yourself online and some reason watching a book club about you I hope you're not for your brain but if you are thank you again um I'm gonna start reading the blurb and then I've gathered some questions but we'll just open it up to conversation in the beginning of general first impressions if that sounds good okay a year into her dream job at a cutthroat Silicon Valley startup Cassie finds herself trapped in a corporate nightmare. Between the long hours, toxic bosses, and unethical projects, she, al she also struggles to reconcile the glittering promise of a city where obscene wealth lives alongside abject poverty and suffering. Ivy League grads complain about the snack selection from a conference room with a view of unhoused people bathing in the bay. Startup burnouts leap into the paths of commuter trains, and men literally set themselves on fire in the streets. Though isolated, Cassie is never alone. From her earliest memory, a miniature black hole has been her constant companion. It feeds on her depression and anxiety, growing or shrinking in relation to her distress. The black hole watches, but it also waits. Its relentless pull draws Cassie ever closer as the world around her unravels. When she ends up unexpectedly pregnant at the same time her CEO demands cross- her CEO's demands cross into illegal territory. Cassie must decide whether the tempting fruits of Silicon Valley are really worth it. Sharp but vulnerable, unsettling but darkly comic, Ripe portrays one millennial woman's journey through our late capitalist hellscape and offers a brilliantly incisive look at the absurdities of modern life. Yeah. Um, so again, I'd love to just open the conversation into people's first impressions if they feel like they want to share anything before we dive into the more guided conversation points. Um, did you like it? Did this book work for you? Um, anything you want to share? For um what for my review I hope that Sarah is not listening to her own book club <laughs> I'm just curious how everyone else thought because I don't want to like be the first one and just say a bunch of negative things if everyone else loved it so I will not talk about it first very considerate Lizzie love that <laughs> i personally really enjoyed this book. Um, I just found Cassie to be such an empathetic character. And I can't say I, I loved reading it because it was hard and it was difficult. And so many of the themes like really struck a chord with me, but I felt the need to like engage in her life and engage in her story. So I'm really glad I picked it up, but it was a hard, it was a hard, but intriguing book to read. Yeah, I had mixed reviews, I would say, and probably in the middle. Um, I feel like a lot of the themes and the prose was like purposefully a little bit empty, but I wanted more of it, though I understood there was like purpose to it not, you know, giving me as much as I'd wanted. Um, I do feel like at times it did feel like it was so close to like making me really, like really, you know, drawing me in. Um, but maybe it was a little bit like repetitive and like frustrating in themes. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that it made me uncomfortable. And I think that is the purpose. Um, and I do feel like she was relatable. But I think that at times I was getting a little bit um, like frustrated with where the plot was going. Yeah, I'm a little bit mixed as well. Um, this is definitely one of my most anticipated reads, but I don't think it will be one of the more memorable ones for me for 2023. Um, I think that's for a lot of reasons. I'm just kind a little burnt out on this genre um, of woman in her head who's very privileged and observing life and doesn't know what to do with it all, even though it's unfortunately incredibly relatable, I'm sure, for most people. Um, 
I, I'm just like craving something a little bit weirder. And I do appreciate how she played with form and structure in this book, but I don't know if it always landed for me. Um, there was some like really glimmering moments of the writing being really strong in here for me. And I think the characterization of modern office life felt really real to me and um, disgusting. And I, I really liked how she just kind of dragged that through the mud of just the absurdity of fake computer jobs, which I myself have, you know what I mean? Um, and yeah, an, an interesting read and I'm excited to talk more about it with you all and get into some more specific questions. And to that, let me get into some specific questions. Okay, so I want to talk about form a little bit. Um, this novel is divided into sections that are like based on the structure of the pomegranate, which are exocarp, mesocarp, membrane, and seed. How how did the organization of the novel in this way work for you all? And I guess like why do you think she organized the novel in this way? And how how did you feel like these terms related to the sections that they represent? Did you pay much attention to these as you're reading the book? Um, general impressions, I guess, about form and her choices there. I thought it was just, <laughs> I thought it was just like a painfully obvious metaphor. Um, like me, it, a lot of times her metaphors made me think of my intro to poetry class and like me trying to be like really deep and writing about fruit or black holes or um, something that I just feel like it's so overdone. The, the genre that you say that you've maybe read too much, I also feel like I've been reading it so much. I call it woman consciously being a dumb bitch. And <laughs> I feel like I've read better in that genre. Like, I feel like I've even, I'm like trying to remember one that I've read in which like a woman is pursuing a, an unavailable man and gets pregnant or like has a pregnancy scare. And I think I, is it Luster? I can't remember if there's a pregnancy scare in Luster, but I just feel like that this has been done already and it's been done better. Yeah, they were a little cloying for me as well. I will say not so much the the segments of the book that are mimicking the layers of the pomegranate, but the definitions kind of drew like drove me crazy in here. Um it just felt purposeless, really, and like a little twee. Uh and I don't I don't I still don't understand what the point of them was. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I like the, I feel like I have a lot of similar thoughts to you, Lizzie. Like uh, the book to me felt super, both with all of the form choices, but then just like the way that she talked about like corporate life felt like way too on the nose. Like it just felt kind of like someone had like learned, heard about like a stereotypical like toxic work environment and like just had never actually been in one, but then wrote about it. And I felt like she was really trying to like like add some depth and add some like bigger picture with the form and the changes, but it just like did not land for me at all. Like the, I was, yeah, the, the definitions part was like annoying to me to read. I kind of wanted to just get past those and get into the, the story again. I mean, I guess it provided some helpful background, but yeah, I agree. I like, I really wanted it to like really hit me, but it just did not. I agree. Um, I think that maybe trying to um, break down the parts of the pomegranate and stuff or is maybe her attempt at removing herself from her experiences, like past and present, and just trying to like break those down individually instead of like dealing with the emotions of it and just like looking at it from a logical standpoint but um yeah I it kind of got um like exhausting a little bit like that format after a while when I just was ready to um just get into the 
narrative and the prose of it. Yeah, it felt like a lot of stops and starts rather than something that like supported where the story was going. And I'm like, look, I'm rereading them right now and exocarp, the outermost layer of a ripened fruit. So it's like literally beginning, middle and end and like the journey to the center of, I guess, the void and the character. We do get closer to Cassie as, as the narrative continues. And I think she gets closer to herself as well, which is interesting, I guess. But I don't know if it had to be so, I guess, on the nose, which seems like our kind of general consensus here. Um, yeah, that that stop and start bothered me way less than the definitions at, at some of the beginning of the chapter heads. Like one was like technology and family. I'm like, I don't, what are we doing? Like, <laughs> I, I would understand it more if it was a scientific term and supported more of the like space metaphors that were going on in this book. But I, I just didn't understand the need to spell out like what technology or, or family or love really means um, to her, I guess. I felt like she was trying to use it as a vehicle to bring in flashbacks or to bring in past memories. Yeah. But it, it's almost like a page break could have done the same thing had she kind of allowed the reader to like do it on their own. I I think for me, at least like the setup was just something I kind of glanced over. Like I just ignored it completely because I didn't feel like it was very additive and I was more engaged in this story. So just like wanted to get past it to progress. Yeah. I totally spaced on that. She, she definitely mentioned that in her interview she did with my friend Jalen on his podcast, reading the room, but they are used for her to break the current day narrative and, and go into flashbacks. And I guess that makes me like them more a little bit, but I don't, it still, it still feels a little twee to me in some way. I don't know. There's something about a definition in this kind of novel that just broke it out for me, which feels like our general consensus. Um, moving on to us all, uh, sipping on that haterade, uh, I'd love to talk about, like, the idea of the believers and the company structure that Cassie is working in, and, like, according to Cassie, believers are the people who are born to be in Silicon Valley and come from, like, Ivy League and throw their entire beings into this technology landscape. Um, what did you think about, I guess, the way... Cassie is continually describing this set of people, even though she's a part of it. Yeah, that to me was like, I understood it immediately when she introduced them in like the first page and was like, I've split myself and partioned myself in order to survive in this city. Um, And like, she's under this you know, role-playing of believers, but then I'm wondering, like, how do you know others aren't role-playing and you've never not role-played? So, like, does that, that doesn't give you opportunity to, like, connect and, like, showcase, you know, if you're always pretending um, and, like, cosplaying as believer, they're going to believe, assume that you are one too. And I think that was, like, some of the frustration of, like, the having problems with doing nothing of it and like continuously um allowing the stream to like take you even though you're you hate it you're not resisting it or like showing up differently um but I also like to that note do think that some people are more like born and bred for a certain lifestyle and you know you see through her traumas that it doesn't come innate to her um but I was also curious to see like how she's so good at be being a believer, but like not getting any credit for it. I feel like that part of her backstory wasn't really expanded on of like how she's incredible at this job, um, doesn't get any credit for it, but she's so incredible. And you see her in the meetings and like her ideas, you know, she's coming across as such a believer, but I'm like, I was curious to know a little bit more of like a backdrop of like, oh, clearly she's really smart and strategic and that she's able to turn it on um and I was uh, curious to know why and where that comes from yeah I I agree with that I feel like that was like a 
part that could have been there could have been so much more depth there because like I immediately same thing like you totally get and understand this distinction she's making and like like I used to work in a very corporate environment and totally get the feeling of like looking around at everyone and being like are you like you think this is okay like are you enjoying this but I wish that I feel like she spent like a hundred pages just like making that very surface level distinction. And I wish that she went deeper into like maybe some scenes where they like really got into the heads of like some of the believers and like, like, I just feel like there could have been so much there where she started like pushing back a little more or like explored more right. Like as to why like Cassie's like that herself or why her coworkers are like that. But it felt like it was this, surface level thing that she never really explored. This is just like a note, but um, when I was reading about these like corporate settings, I was just thinking about like Theranos the whole time. <laughs> like, um, I don't know, like everyone doesn't, like no one really likes what's going on, but they want that job and they want the status of what it means to be working there and if there were to be a breakthrough they want their name on it um yeah I don't know but I I agree that it a would have been more effective if if she went a bit deeper with it yeah that makes me think of another question I have which I guess is around intimacy and the role of intimacy in this novel um there's a scene where Sasha has them divulge like their most traumatic experiences to have a greater sense of camaraderie throughout their team in the workplace and it backfires and um, people feel antagonistic for, for having like forced to share in that setting. Um, I guess like, how do you feel the role what what is like forced intimacy and how does it come up in this novel? Do you think that Cassie has genuine genuine relationships with any of her coworkers or her friends or even her love interest in this book? I mean, we kind of see this in her relationship with her dad, right? Like, even though I wouldn't say he was a wonderful dad by any means, it seems like he's the only person that she can really go to when she's hitting the he these like points of breakdown um and I think that kind of goes to show that she has like no support or no intimacy with with um the rest of the folks in, in the in the novel but I, I do like find the the question of intimacy really interesting especially when you're thinking about the office environment and how she describes it as like this open floor plan where everybody's monitoring what you're eating and how frequently you're going to the bathroom and like what you're doing and if you're on your phone and it, it's like Again, of course, Missy, like you were saying, but building resentment in, in a different way. Mm -hmm. I thought the parent storyline was the most interesting storyline. The the relationship between her mother and father. Yeah, I agree. All of those flashback sections and I guess just like giving some kind of reason for how she's building relationships and viewing especially the romantic partner in her life who I think was weird the chef person um felt felt really interesting to read and like pretty grounding for her um what about her relationship with Sasha under this like guise of intimacy I think I would I think I would argue that like that is what intimacy is like they are intimate with one another it's just not healthy Yeah, I feel like the crescendo moment for me was the flashback, the final flashback with her mom in the parking lot, like not the being consumed by the black hole, because I wrote down in like page four, like the end, she will be consumed by black hole, like she will yeah. submit to it. Um, I feel like that was the moment when you're like, oh, like every person in her life is a version of her mother, like Sasha speaks is her mother. Um, I'm forgetting the friend, like the very unhinged friend who yeah. like switches it up so quick. Like that is her mother. Um, like that for me was the one part that made things click. Um, and it was the only, not the only, not the only like 
tension moment for me, but I think that was like the moment for me in the novel where things like made sense and like the knot was tied. Yeah, I agree with that. Viewing all of, especially her relationship with women through the lens of her just trying to like people please and appease her mother is really interesting. And how that plays out at work, I think could have been like a whole book, you know, <laughs> that that could have, the Sasha part and replicating those relationships that she has with other women in her life could have been the meat of this instead of some of these things that felt a little bit more half-baked to me. Yeah, and I think a lot of themes of fertility and, and motherhood and, mm -hmm. you know, then you see Sasha who, like, wants to be a mother, who you see as a form of her mother, and you're like, should you bring children into this world? Like, are you, is what happened to Cassie going to happen if Sasha has children? Um, and then you see Cassie, like, well, I, I'm not fit for motherhood, like, I'm not going to keep this baby because I don't like trust myself not having a family. Um, but yeah, I haven't thought too much on that fertility theme, but it definitely was, you know, seed through pregnancy, um, trauma bonds, motherhood, all of that. Yeah. Does anyone know what the pomegranate in Greek mythology is? It's something about motherhood, right? <laughs> As she mentioned something that I don't remember yeah um I think it's I think it's just um like the fruit like the womb I think it has to do with like the womb bearing like bearing fruit I don't know mm -hmm. I was thinking the significance with the pomegranate was because her before she had the abortion wasn't it the cells were a pomegranate seed right so it was, that was like the one time that it stuck out to me so I was thinking that's why it was pulled out but I don't necessarily know if I could like draw meaning in that too much mm -hmm. yeah she definitely said the doctor said that this the cluster of cells was the size of a pomegranate seed but then like the author just took it way too far I think there's a moment with the chef when she had, you know, all of her fun facts um, and was getting like the validation from him every time. Um, I think she said something about the like, I remember that being a moment where I was like, oh, OK, tie back to the the cover. I see this like obvious call out. And I think it I don't remember, but I remember I think it was a scene with the chef. Um, with him and how it's like ironic how excited he is that she knows this thing but it's later going to be you know their baby that he probably wouldn't want to keep and then it rots the pomegranate rots on her table or something I just googled it and the pomegranate is in the Persephone myth which she was the one who was captured by Hades and raped like it's a really common rape imagery motif um and it's saying it represents life regeneration and marriage and Hades tricked her into eating it so I think I I mean I usually like stuff like that tiebacks or throwbacks to these kind of like culturally woven into our fabric pieces of imagery and everything um and I think it could have been done without the structuring of the fruit again. Again, this just comes back to structuring in some ways for me. I'm like, can I please remove the fluff and just get into, like, just just put your writing out there, you know? It, it almost felt like a little bit of a a fear thing um, for me as a reader sometimes, like a like a blocking from the, the actual story that was going on instead of a device that was used to get deeper into things. It felt more of like a defensive move. Um and I think paired with like Cassie as a character that just didn't always work for me, especially with some of these more sensitive themes about current events. And then also like deep wound traumas, such as, you know, your mother, not <laughs> your mother, not loving or respecting you. Um, I think we just could have got closer to the truth there. 
<sighs> Did anyone else get strong 2005 era Chuck Palahniuk vibes from the gimmicky de- definitions? Yeah, again, it's just, and that's like another writer I feel like who uses blocking motifs and like distraction instead of being able to to get closer to whatever the meat of of the narrative is. Uh, speaking of blocking defenses, maybe we talk about the black hole now um, and how how that was effective in, in the narrative and the story and um, what its presence felt like to you and how it escalated certain events in the novel. Um, yeah, how is our black hole working for us? I don't know if it was like quite a, I I don't know if it was like a complete stand-in for depression, which I think is usually the most like one-to-one motif when depression is described. It was something else, something maybe more about detachment and like depersonalization, um, which I think worked more for Cassie and kind of her her disconnect from like her own lived experience and kind of wanting to get farther away from herself so she doesn't really have to feel it um yeah I mean as much go ahead I know she mentioned dissociation a few times but yeah I got I I thought it was depression from the majority of the book and I tried so hard to like form an attachment to that aspect of it I I mean I think I started and stopped it like six times before I finally finished it all the way through just like thinking like oh yeah because like we're all mentally ill like let's all collectively like love this metaphor but it just again it's another one that for me felt flat yeah I think I I liked when it was described as being like protective of her because it is again like another layer I guess to go back to our fruit metaphor of protecting her from herself and like the outside world and even her family at times um yeah for all the critiques and like gimmicks that I think this book employs this this landed okay for me which I feel is good right (laughs) we got we're batting one out of five here I think the part that I liked about the or the part that like landed for me about the whole black hole was when she was talking about like envisioning her future children and envisioning like the future child having the black hole and even like when they did the ultrasound and like seeing the black hole next to it because I felt like those were the moments when I was able to like connect with Cassie more because it was more of like you know it wasn't so surface level of like, life sucks. I'm working this crazy job. I have this guy that doesn't like me. Like it was a little bit deeper of like, wow, this is something that is like embedded in me. And I'm like terrified that I'm going to pass it along to like future generations. Like that just hit for me a lot more. So I felt like those were some of the moments where I was able to like feel a little bit more empathetic. And like, I was like actually seeing into her, her brain a little bit more. Yeah, I felt like generational, like all of the stuff that her mom was afraid of and would just um, You're breaking up. it's about relationship and then also being terrified that she'll things makes her make her charlie is the robot over for everyone okay great (laughs) i'm sorry you you turn into a robot My Zoom cut out. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're okay. You're okay. I think you're talking about generational embedded in in um Cassie and 
that being a motif of just the endless void of following that lineage and like where it lives inside of you and trying to find a source and it's just like doesn't exist because it's probably forever ago (laughs) which I agree with yeah um I want to save us talking about like the black hole experience until the end of the conversation because then I think that'll be our final question but um I'm also curious how we felt about I guess the backdrop of like very recent global crises happening in this book um and the depiction of them from like the wildfires to the unhoused people to the virus um and how how did that work for you all I feel like this is maybe one of the handful of like pandemic centric novels that I've read um and how how did that depiction of the reality that we all lived through feel for you all that was rendered in this book this was perhaps and I think other folks might disagree but this is perhaps the first pandemic novel that I feel like I've read that was done successfully in the sense that it wasn't it wasn't so focused on the pandemic but more focused on like everything but the pandemic, like the, the fact that everyone wanted to ignore it. No one wanted to like see this as something that was was going to come and was going to shake things up. And and like that experience of like feeling scared, but no one's validating you at the same time. So you're kind of like questioning um, how dangerous this thing really is. You're kind of questioning your own sanity. And, and that was something that I really, really enjoyed about it. Like I just found that part particularly relatable and not something that I feel like has been captured super well before by other pandemic literature. I yeah. agree with that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Whoever else is talking. You go, Lizzie. It was just me. Okay. <laughs> I agree with that. I felt like like it was approached very sensitively and I appreciate that uh especially not not only the virus um the pandemic but also the way that the character approaches uh the houseless community outside of her work and like the juxtaposition of that with where she is working and just like living in Portland I felt like that was really relatable um and I'm glad that it was not desensitized yeah I think it was really interesting. It was like the precipice of the pandemic. So going back to what I think um, someone said earlier, like that timing and the focus on everything except that felt really fresh to me. And I think really realistic and foreboding of like an element of what we knew was to come in some way. Right. Okay, I guess we'll talk about the ending now um, and our interpretation of the ending. I, to refresh everyone's memory, she, you know, submits herself to the void, if you will. And I think I'll read this last little paragraph here. The black hole draws closer, ever closer, the darkness blotting out the old world, offering another future, another path off offering either an an ending or a beginning. I step forward for once I do not waver. I look up into the familiar darkness with the red fruit of my heart full in my throat. I give myself up. Um, I feel like there's a couple interpretations here and it probably doesn't matter what actually happened or not because <laughs> it's a novel, but I'd be curious to hear from you all what you think happens at the end, especially because of the conversation she has with her family prior to um this moment I I read it as her um unaliving herself yeah like uh, yeah that's how I took it yeah I think she kills herself as well um which is pretty depressing (laughs) um not to laugh but that's that is pretty depressing because the the 
it, it really crescendos at the end here, huh? Like, I'm like, damn, dude, we had other options. Like, let me let me talk to you a little bit here before we we move forward with this. And it's just really isolating and sad. And I think was really effective. Like, I, I remember staying up late to finish the end um, of this book one night and just being like, okay, now I'm going to go to sleep, I guess. Like, that was the saddest possible resolution of this book. Um, and I think also, like, gave it a, a, a notch up in the star rating for me as well, because I'm glad something happened, I guess, like, in a narrative way. Um, yeah, I don't know. It made me feel very sad and gross and um, helpless, really, for a fictional character. I might bump up my star rating too. I just finished the book like 15 minutes before this book club. So now I want to go back and my mind has been blown. I did not get that. So I'm going (laughs) to reread that part. Yeah, reread that last little chapter there because I mean, the reason I think she killed herself is because, oh, what did she say? I can't remember. It's something to the to a kind of like what do you what do you feel when you know it's the last time like some something like that and that is the the thing that clicked in my head of like oh she's physically doing something right now especially paired with um, calling her dad and being like I will always love you parents um, yeah for me like even at the very early chapters of this book I I felt like this was the imminent ending like this was what was for sure going to happen. I think that added another layer for me because I just felt her stuckness. And yes, like she had a lot of other options, but to Cassie, like she did not. And yeah. like feeling that build up and, and kind of knowing where, where things were going, like it had an emotional layer that, w- that was like, honestly, very like difficult to get through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's sad because she has that love, like, from her father, but she's not really getting, she's not giving any love to herself. So at the end of it all, like, like, she doesn't have anything. Yeah. She's not giving that, um, she's not giving herself grace or any love at all. In the final part, when she was talking to her dad, though, about like, it was like breaking my heart every single time he would. <laughs> oh no! I think you're okay. Okay, okay. Um, when she was talking to him, and like it's like he does love her, but um, really. <laughs> Let's see if I can mute you. Which I don't want to, but you're a robot. Okay. You robot it again. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jill. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, just how many times the dad kept saying throughout the book, and even at the very end, like, there's nothing for you here, basically telling her not to come back. And like I think it just set up this very much like black and white picture of happiness. Like it's either like it's good or bad, she can't go back, everything's bad. But it, for some reason, it didn't even cross my mind that she would kill herself possibly at the end until like the final chapter. I was like, oh, this is happening because I just kept waiting for her to like blow things up and like do something with like work. But she just walked out and then like, you don't really know if anything happens with the chef. There was like this really, I was like so horrible to read at the end when he told her that he went with his girlfriend to that same shop that she was saying, like, it just, it, it, part of me was like disappointed because I was like waiting for something. I wanted her to like, really like make a move and do something different and like find a new life and find some happiness and value somewhere else. But like definitely understand from her perspective, like why I felt like she just couldn't. So I feel like I need to reread the last chapter too, because I finished it like really late one night this week. And I remember like my stomach hurt. I was like, oh, that just made me feel like 
like icky, which is what it is trying to do. So like hats off. And I think that's why I gave it, um, you know, the rating that I did, but I, it didn't, it wasn't very obvious to me because I was like, is she just like wholesome consumed now by this depression where she cannot do anything? Like you are just, you don't have the energy to be your other self. But I was also really curious as to like, why was the breaking point, the abortion? Like, why was that it? Why not like crumbling another company or like, being called these like incredibly dehumanizing insults by your boss and your friends um so I don't know if anybody has an opinion on that but to me I was really curious as to like how and why that was the moment because you didn't see any like motifs of her wanting to be a mother the entire time she's like continuing to drink and do drugs and um not loving like and caring for her body so it wasn't like she told the chef and then he you know because she felt he wouldn't accept her she did it so I didn't quite understand the reasoning of why that was the moment um and yeah now knowing that she potentially committed suicide I'm like oh okay she did I agree like it's not I'm not happy about it but I'm like there's some movement there's some will to do something I think the abortion is the only time where she took actionable steps to doing something for herself um so yeah interesting yeah I definitely feel a little weird now that I'm like looking back at this book and the almost direct precursor to her doing that is the abortion scene and I think it's just I I I think it is potentially problematic because it puts like undue emotional significance on like a medical procedure but also shows the reality of what that feels like and like how it forced her to be in her body for the first time in a long time and like reckon with her choices in a way that felt really tangible to herself and like feel where it was going yeah and the shame of of all of the societal you know perceptions of what it means to be a person who gets an abortion um and that that it kind of does make more sense to me like that was the the ignition to her like taking some form of form of action because it is so physical and it really like forced her to be in her body for the first time in a long time that wasn't about sex hmm I'll also say my internet was like cutting out before when we were talking about the um, like pandemic portion, but I feel like that was also a note of how somebody who's like so hyper vigilant um, and like in fawn mode at all times is just like aware of pain in the world, whereas everybody else in her surrounding was like so intently selfish that like nobody else thought they could be touched um by the pandemic and also just didn't care that people are like dying and setting themselves on fire so that was a part of Cassie that like that was my favorite part of her that like empathy and it was the only time she would like bring something up in a room where people didn't want it brought up so I do feel like the pandemic backdrop um showed a part of her character that we didn't really get elsewhere Mm-hmm. yeah I'd agree with that just kind of like the identity of being an observer and like a witness to things and how that ties into kind of the depersonalization and disassociation themes in this book because you do have like a hyper vigilance of everything that's not you you know um so I think the pandemic is a perfect backdrop for that like what everything you just said and I found the line that made me think that this is a suicide at the end of the book um did I just lose it again? No, I found it. <laughs> what would you do if you knew it was the last time? Because I know it will be the last time. A sob escapes my throat. And then, like, she immediately calls her dad. So. Just wanted to read that, I guess. Hmm. 
Mm. What was your what was your least favorite intro to poetry line? Mine was our love bloomed like a thousand cherry blossoms between us. Yeah, that's really bad. That is really bad. I don't have one marked because I didn't annotate this book, but that is uh, a little painful. She also described one of her drinks as the color of a thousand sunsets. Hell yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Writers do be writing, you know? (laughs) Oh, man. Um, Cool. Is there anything else that we didn't cover that you guys want to talk about? Any, Any specific passages we should go to before we wrap this up? I guess, um, how did people feel about the guy literally being on fire, like, at the very beginning, and how you felt about that, like, in the context of the rest of the story? I guess, yeah, he was a pretty substantial character, wasn't he? That was actually a moment where I was like, oh, this is going to be good. Like, that's dark. That's intense. And it got me, like, riled and excited. Um, And then nothing kind of met the energy of the fire suicide. Yeah, it's kind of bookends of the, the book, which is interesting. She starts with, like, a really evocative image and then ends with it as well. Wow, how pomegranate of her. Lizzie Lizzie is coming for Sarah's throat I did want to offer a book suggestion the reason I picked up right was because I have kind of a niche interest in the Silicon Valley like yeah culture and and all this and um I think a couple years ago I read the memoir Uncanny Valley mm-hmm. and I I just can't recommend that book enough I feel like it, it looks at work culture um, but through a very intellectual lens and, and it's very well done and the narrator is extremely smart and, and describing these real life experiences that she's had. So if anybody else has that um, kind of interest, I, I think that, that that book would pair excellently with this one and maybe um, hit some of those needs that, that, that people were saying they didn't feel like were fulfilled here. Love that. I also read a book called The Exhibition of Persephone Q. Um, yeah. And it's about the myth of Persephone, but set in a modern context and it has a pregnancy in it as well. So I feel like if you want commentary on motherhood and the art world and a sad girl book that's not overtly using poetry motifs, I'd recommend that too for some pomegranate reading. If you're not sick of the pomegranate imagery in your life from this for a while. I also feel like Paradise Rock by Jenny Ball. This reminded me, I mean, I read that book years ago, but I was like, oh, this kind of reminds me of bordering what that book did. Um, if you do want more. But it, it it goes a little bit more hard in like the insanity aspect, which I appreciate. Yeah. We need more craziness. Okay. Well, enjoy your weekend party, people. Thank you for coming. I did get more out of this book from a discussion, which is always the point of these book clubs. So thank you for your time and your beautiful brains. And I hope to see you guys on the internet. Well, do you have a date for the librarianist book club? It'll be end of the month. So whatever the last Saturday of the month is, um, I'll be sending those out soon. So yeah, I'll add you to the invite if you want to come, Lizzie. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm going to get it on Libro FM. Cool. Audiobook girl. (laughs) Cool. Thank you, guys.